The following program is brought to you as a public service by Pulse Metric Incorporated, maker of DynaPulse blood pressure and cardiovascular monitors. A major chronic condition in the United States. That's how the Heart, Lung and Blood Institute describes heart failure. Despite tremendous advances in the diagnosis and treatment of heart failure, the incidence, prevalence and morbidity resulting from this disorder continues to escalate. According to the agency, an estimated 4.8 million Americans have heart failure. Each year there are an estimated 400,000 new cases. Heart failure is part of our success. Uh, in past years there were a variety of diseases that people died from heart attacks, uh, high blood pressure, severe valvular heart disease among them. And we've gotten awfully good at treating those things and the mortality from heart disease has gone way down. But unfortunately the damage that gets done persists. And the damage to the pumping function of the heart is what produces heart failure. The reasons for it are complex they're related to the fact that heart failure is predominantly, although not exclusively, a disease of older people. And as the population ages, we can expect to see more heart failure on that basis. Heart failure is a progressive clinical syndrome in which the heart can't pump enough blood to meet the needs of the body's organs and tissues. There are a lot of classifications that you could use, classifications based on underlying etiology and so on, classifications according to whether or not it's acute or chronic, and then we stage the heart failure often by talking about New York Heart Association functional classification. But probably the most important or one of the most important differentiations is between whether or not heart failure is due to systolic or diastolic dysfunction, because the treatment modalities will be quite different. Systolic dysfunction simply means that the pumping action of the heart is abnormal so that with each systole the amount of blood that's ejected is less than normal. This elicits a number of compensatory mechanisms including increases in cardiac size and activation of the neurohormonal systems to try to augment cardiac output and blood pressure. Ultimately, those compensatory mechanisms backfire and lead to further remodeling of the heart. Diastolic dysfunction is a definition for abnormalities in relaxation of the heart. That is, the pumping capacity of the heart may be perfectly normal However, the heart is not able to relax normally. And if one looks at the pressure volume relationship in the left ventricle as it fills during diastole, it's usually a very flat curve so that the volumes that enter the ventricle during diastole cause relatively small increases in pressure. However, as that ventricle gets stiff or non-compliant, the pressure volume relationship is shifted upwards. And what that means is to accommodate the same volume during diastole that's necessary for an adequate stroke volume, the pressure within the ventricle rises considerably. That rise in pressure in the ventricle during diastole is then transmitted back through the left atrium and pulmonary veins to the pulmonary capillary bed and gives rise to the symptoms of shortness of breath and, if severe enough, pulmonary congestion. The list of contributing factors for heart failure is substantial. It includes coronary artery disease, past heart attack or myocardial infarction with scar tissue that interferes with the normal work of heart muscle, diabetes, heart valve disease, endocarditis or myocarditis due to past rheumatic rheumatic fever or other causes, cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, toxic substances including prolonged alcohol abuse, severe lung disease, anemia, hyperthyroidism, and high blood pressure. 
It's important to note that a 1997 NIH study found high blood pressure to be the chief risk factor for heart failure. Uncontrolled high blood pressure increases the risk of heart failure by 200%. Hypertension is involved uh, in, in, in the development of congestive heart failure through two mechanisms. It may be through systolic dysfunction, which occurs as a result of decreased ventricular function, usually as a result of cardiovascular disease associated with hypertension, but in many cases also results in congestive heart failure through diastolic dysfunction which occurs as a result of abnormalities to the compliance of the left ventricle of the heart and the blood vessels, they become stiffer and as a consequence result in congestive heart failure. Heart failure patients often experience and present with problems due to fatigue, congestion and edema. It's heart failure per se, although we use it interchangeably as a diagnosis, is really a, a symptom complex and heart failure can involve fatigue, poor energy, just can't do what I used to do. Um, from lower cardiac output, the heart's not pumping enough blood around the body. The congestive symptoms that can come with that are shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, laying down at night, waking up suddenly and, and gasping for air, or abdominal bloating and seeing ankle swelling. If neither readily identifiable signs nor the patient's history points to a clear-cut diagnosis, an electrocardiogram is used to evaluate the electrical activity of a patient's heartbeat. An echocardiogram can reveal abnormal heart size, shape, and movement. A chest x-ray may be used to determine heart size and shape, as well as congestion in the lungs. For some patients, cardiac catheterization is often used. An important tool in assessing heart failure is knowing a patient's ejection fraction. That is, the amount of blood pumping out when the heart contracts. Normally about 66% of blood is ejected from the heart chamber during contraction. Heart failure patients often have an ejection fraction less than 45%. An increasing number of effective ways are now available to manage heart failure. The initial management if someone has congestive symptoms usually starts with a diuretic. That treats symptoms but it doesn't treat the underlying disease. It treats the symptoms of heart failure but not the cardiomyopathy or, or heart muscle problem. Um, so the more important measures to, to institute start with medications in the category called ACE inhibitors um, which can prevent the onset of heart failure or markedly reduce how fast that comes if someone has an enlarged heart that's weaker but very minimal symptoms. Um, it can slow down the progression of disease but it doesn't always stop it. Um, in the United States, unlike Europe, we also use um, digitalis preparations or digoxin, lanoxin. When people have residual symptoms despite the ACE inhibitors and diuretics, the next layer of therapy becomes then the, the beta blockers. Beta adrenergic receptor blockers are becoming more prevalent. The drug works on the body's sympathetic nervous system, blocking responses of stress-related hormones and making the heart beat more efficiently. Beta blockers can reduce mortality, decrease hospitalization, improve symptoms, as well as the quality of life. The combination of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers now in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction as a cause of heart failure would be expected to reduce annual mortality in the range of 50 percent. However, for years, doctors have been concerned about using beta blockers in heart failure patients because the initial dose may make the condition worse. Beta blockers are, are drugs which are double-edged sword while they have the ability over the long term to ameliorate congestive heart failure, they have the potential in the short term to actually compromise heart failure somewhat. And, and so when we administer these drugs, we administer them very, very cautiously, typically start, start with low dose and then slowly titrate upward. There is another factor, however, that I think has played a role and that is with the use of ACE inhibitors and powerful diuretics, 
the majority of the heart failure patients, and most of, this would involve most of the patients, are really quite well compensated at any given time. And I think that there is a feeling of reassurance on the part of the physician and the patient that the patient is doing well and there may not be a need to initiate another therapy, particularly one that's going to obligate gradual up titration and the risk of upsetting what had been a stable situation. But it's worth pointing out that although the patient is doing well, the remodeling process is, continually, is continuing to progress. Because of the proven benefit of beta blockers, new methods which help ensure patient safety are a welcome addition. Any kind of monitoring capability that we can introduce that can be employed by an outpatient in their home or home-like uh, setting and then transmitted to us would be of, of great value in going through this, this uh, touchy period where we're administering the beta blockers and, and, and watching for side effects. In addition to pharmacological therapy, lifestyle modifications are needed to improve a patient's quality of life. Patients are urged to stop drinking alcohol, quit smoking, and carefully monitor their weight. The other big lifestyle modifications that's hard um, is sodium restriction, but that's absolutely vital um, to the management of congestive symptoms. Um, the abnormal heart, for whatever reasons, creates a syndrome of sodium retention. So any essential salt that's taken in by the body is avidly saved and therefore water with it. Advances in the treatment of heart failure have been dramatic in the last decade. Even more encouraging are innovative therapies and technologies on the horizon. There are new and emerging therapies including other neurohormonal blockers to block the activation of the endothelin system and of cardiac cytokines that are likely to become important in the future. The use of devices resynchronization through biventricular pacing is a therapy that in preliminary studies appears to be helpful in reducing symptoms of heart failure and improving exercise tolerance. Cardiac transplantation is also a therapy that I think has improved dramatically over the past two to three decades. Here in our center, we can now quote patients an expected survival of over 90% at one year and over 80% at five years. I look for a variety of therapies that will enhance the basic molecular um, uh, mechanisms by which heart muscle cells contract and perhaps even increase the number of cells, regenerate cells, uh, as a method to, to treat heart failure.